Hey, my dear church family and so many friends who are joining us all around the world, literally online for church tonight. Uh, it is not the same here without you. And let me first say we miss you so very much. This campus is so empty without all of our wonderful church people here with us. But we're here tonight, and it's a little bit of a different format. Backed by popular demand, uh, I've asked Pastor to do another Q&A session. And so tonight, all throughout the broadcast, I'll be monitoring Facebook right here on my laptop. And in the feed there, you can put your question, whatever you want to ask, and uh, I'll be watching and I'll pass those questions along tonight. And it's going to be a great night. We're joined by Pastor David Thomas and Pastor Joe Mulvihill as well, and we're going to have a good time together. But before I turn it over to Pastor, I want to play you a video from Easter Sunday morning last weekend. We, uh, we, we released this online, and at this point it's had over 30,000 views this week. And it's our choir. We couldn't be together on Easter Sunday. So I said, let's do this virtually. And everybody sending videos from home. We put it all together into this song, Is He Worthy? And I pray it's a blessing to you. But if you'll do me a favor, if you'll go to the First Assembly Facebook at some time tonight and find it, it's pinned at the top there. As soon as you get to the top of that page, you'll see this video. If you haven't already, would you click share on that and share it with all of your friends? That helps us reach and reach and reach with this song. And not only the song, the powerful message in it, Is He Worthy? We believe he is, and I know you do too. Be blessed tonight. Is all creation growing? And is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves? Does the Father truly love us? He does. does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? David's fruit and the lamb who died to 
That's just amazing to me. I, I've seen that now several times. Jonathan, how in the world? Is this your invention or did you? <laughs> no, I, I cannot claim uh, credit for the idea, but we took it and sort of made it our own. And everybody did their video at home with a click track in their ear and uh, they counted in so we could get it synced up. And then they got those files to us. We sent the audio to Nashville to be mixed and sent the video to Wisconsin where it was put together and then everything was sent back to us and we used it last Sunday and, it's, and it literally has just gone further than what we expected at this point. I, I'm curious. I don't understand technology at all, which you know. I've just learned how to operate a radio. <laughs> but how in the world did you get how many people did you have there? I think there were, uh, there were close to 80 choir members and then the band guys too. So how do they all sing on the same note? They, they, uh, I sent them a track and they put one headphone in. I said, leave one headphone out because you need pitch reference desperately. <laughs> Nobody can sing with two headphones in. And so they, they put uh, one headphone in and with one device played the track and then they had to use another device and film themselves or have somebody film them and so it uh one lady uh one lady in the choir i got tickled her husband they came by to give me the file and he said i worked on this all day <laughs> and bless his heart she had had him put a light up on a ladder and had the had the words taped across the front of the thing and i mean she took it seriously <laughs> so so but they all got it done and and uh, we got it all submitted and put together for easter and i am so proud of everybody it, it stretched them for sure I would think you'd be proud of that. Absolutely. It's not in the Bible, but somebody said uh, necessity is the mother of invention. That's right. I don't think that's in the Bible, is it? <laughs> not in mine. Not in mine. But it's not it's, in mine. But we have seen so much. Uh, I think Saddleback did something like this, my friend David Jeremiah. They did something like they this. They did actually. last weekend, too. The same, the same song, oddly enough, and uh, it was so neat what they did. I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, all the session singers in Nashville got together and did it as well. I think I sent you I've that. I've seen that. And that was sort of what spurred the idea in my heart to do this. And the same guy who mixed the audio on theirs uh, mixed ours, and I felt like it, it came together so well. There's some guy uh, from his home or a studio that does a lot of very close harmony. I forget his name. And he does all the parts at one time. I can't he, think of his name and he's either. Incredible. Yeah. Yes, yes, I know. He does a lot about. of high low singers unlimited stuff, yes, you know. Yes. Beautiful. I, but maybe that's where it all got started. I think that was sort of I, I have a feeling because his stuff went viral and I have a feeling that when this came about that sort of inspired some of this, yeah. Well what, what do you think, Jonathan, next Saturday if we're still on this plan yes. you know, of not going anywhere. If you could have somebody fill every seat in this, <laughs> huh? would that work out okay? Do you know there is a video that's gone viral and it's on Facebook right now. A lot of people are posting it and it was of a, of a dear pastor. It was a smaller church and, and uh, they got together and he came in last Sunday to preach and it was not what he expected. They had 
large photographs of every family in that church in the spot where they sit. And, and he was just overcome with emotion. And he went around t touching all of his people and looking at their pictures, and he just began to weep, you know. Well, what does that say about us? We had 50 puppets. Sitting <laughs> Well, your 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 staff is not quite as uh, quite Dedicated. as cosmopolitan. <laughs> That's so true. Well, it's sure good to see you, my friend. I I wish you were here. I, I know you can't be. I understand that, but I wish you were here. Boy, we miss we miss them, Dave. Yes, we yes, do. The most precious people. You know, I'm an old, old, old guy, and I've met a lot of people in my lifetime. But the folks in this church are so dedicated, so gracious, yes. so generous, and any other good accolade I can think of. And I miss them. You miss them terribly. At the close of the service, I'm usually about the last one out of the sanctuary, except for the 930 service Sunday. Yeah. Then I have to get ready for another right. service. But generally, I'm about the last one out, and I just love to talk to the people. And what I'm going to be anxious to hear all their stories yeah. when the sanction is lifted and we can yeah. get together again. You know who's going to be here tomorrow, and this will be live on TV. You know who's going to I didn't tell you. Evidently not, because I don't but know. Tomorrow, in person here, is going to be one of the great heroes of the Bible, Hosea, is going to be here. Really? Yeah, that's right. Did how, you did you, that? how did you work that out? Well, <clears throat> you get a camera here. <laughs> one over here. No, I, I just think the story of Hosea, why somebody hasn't made a terrific movie about that. that is a plot story. to end all plots. And his wife's name was Gomer. Mm -hmm. She was not a nice person. And yet his love for her, it's a tremendous story. And uh, I'm going to get Hosea here tomorrow. He'll probably look a lot like me, but, mm -hmm. but he's going to be here tomorrow. And we're going to tell that story. And we come on the air at what time? 11 o'clock. We'll be live at 11 o'clock. Right here where you are now. So, And my goodness, the crowds we've had on the Internet have been fantastic. Unreal. And not only that, Dave, Dave Thomas has been with me for 31 years. 32. 31. 31 years. And really is the administrator for this place. He's a great musician, a great yes. administrator. Love him to death. And, and uh, what was I going to say? I got to bragging on you and forgot what I was going to You were talking about the offering. Oh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> For some reason, I never forget. How did I forget the offering? I'll tell you, a stroke will kill you. So uh, talk to me about it. We've been doing pretty well. We've been doing actually very well. Um, just so grateful to our congregation for the way that they've been responding, and uh, it's it's been amazing. Week after week, we're we're pushing close to budget every week, and the receipts that are coming in, and uh, contributions that are coming in. People are actually stopping by the church. You know, some people just want to get out of the house, and so they actually come to the front door, and we have a box there, and they. Uh, deposit their contributions and uh, because we don't want anybody to get real close and uh, then we also have people stacks of mail every day are coming in a majority of it contribution and then of course a lot of people just go online and uh, kitties tells me that every time that we start talking about the um, the giving and especially the online giving, she says it, it must remind the people to do their giving because all of a sudden she has a bell that dings on her computer every time there's a contribution online. And she said it just goes nuts, ding, 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 ding. Well, that's, that's amazing. People, uh, people, you've been amazing, and we really sincerely appreciate it. Yes.
We've lost your mic, yeah. Okay, thank you. It should be on the, just hand it to him, yeah. On the, there you go. Now, can you hear me? Yes, sir. On the live presentation, none of this happened. <laughs> just, <laughs> magic of editing. What? Magic of editing. The magic. It just, it's amazing what they can do upstairs. It looked like they came over and took my mic away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that never happened. What were we talking about? The offering. The offering. It's unbelievable. And we thank you so much. We have, uh, I forget how many employees we have here at the church. Uh, with the school and all, it's, it's, close, it's between 120 and 30 employees. Mm -hmm. So that thing, that and means the, the families. Church, the church alone is has probably 80 to 90 employees, depending on the part-time situation, and then the school makes up the, the others. We we send offerings, uh, substantial offerings, to. Uh, 530 or 40 missionaries yes, we do. every month. Every month. <clears throat> and we've done that now for years. Yes. And have never, by the grace of God, Dave, we have never missed a single month. I, I, have, I often wonder when we get to heaven someday and God unleashes all the folks who've been saved through this ministry, I think it'll be thousands upon thousands. And they come up, and that's true of every church that supports missions, not just First Assembly. What a day that's going to be when we see all these folks say thank you for giving to the Lord. That'd make a great song, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think I heard it. Yeah. So that's where I got it. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for your giving. Anything else on that, Dave? No, Pastor. I'm just, like I said, I'm just incredibly grateful for the faithfulness of the people to their church. And we've even received gifts outside of the church. And for, to everyone, thank you. God bless you very much. Grateful. Thank you so much. God bless you. Is that the end of the service, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> Uh, somebody asked, uh, is the gift of prophecy continuing today or has it ceased to function? Well, first of all, you're going to have to define the gift of prophecy. If you're talking about telling the future, I don't think that's part of it at all. If you're talking about anointed forth telling of the gospel, yeah. absolutely. Joe, you're a good theologian. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, we're Pentecostals. We believe the gifts still go. We're told many times, you know this in the New Testament, you're not supposed to despise prophecy. It's, it's, that's singled out as one of the gifts in 1 Corinthians that Paul discusses. So yeah, I'm with you. I, I think we still see it in operation, but it'll have a distinctly different flavor than it had in the Old Testament for a variety of reasons. I sometimes see on the tube uh, preachers uh, putting their hands on people and prophesying something in their future. I'm not sure I buy into that, but I think there are cases where that may happen. But as a rule, I don't think that's what the gift of prophecy was about. You know, in the Bible, if you claim to be a prophet and you missed, man, if we did that today, the rocks would be flying, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, I think there are people that get so caught up in it, they'll say, thus saith the Lord about just about anything, and you just didn't pull that in biblical times. You just didn't. You're either put out of the camp, banished, or killed. So, I, yeah, it's, it's one and done if you miss one in the Old Testament matrix. <laughs> one and done. I could just hear this deep voice from heaven. That's one. <laughs> but uh, a little sidebar on that. You know, I've been preaching the gospel now for uh, about 60 years. And there have been times when I have been quite ill. But I have never one time, and Darlene can confirm this, there's never been one time I've ever walked into a pulpit or a teaching podium to present the gospel when I've been sick. I've said amen and gone home and been sick there. But in declaring the gospel, I think there's something so supernatural about the gospel. And I'm not trying to start a whole new fad here uh, or get crazy. But it's, it just happened in my life. I have never, 
while preaching the gospel or teaching the gospel felt ill. Now, after I watch this tonight, I may feel <laughs> ill, but, but not normally. I, it's a wonderful gift of God, and I thank him. Would you mind commenting just a little bit? We'll move on from the question. But I, I remember in your book before I got here and then hearing you talk about, you've had a premonition that you thought was from the Holy Spirit when you're standing in that bank line, I'll have this place. But you never went on in the pulpit and said, thus saith the Lord, we're gonna, I'm going to have it. You just had that sort of deep speaking unto deep experience for the Spirit. Yeah, that's one of the great moments of my whole life. It's kind of slipped my mind, you know, my that's age. awesome. But but uh, we started a church up in Sandusky, Ohio. And this was in 1974. Mm. And we desperately needed a building. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I think because of the tourist trade up there on Lake Erie, property was terribly expensive, unreasonably so. And every Monday, I used to go down to the bank, the Western Security Bank, on the main downtown corner, a gorgeous four-story marble inside and out building, gorgeous building. And I always loved to go there because it reminded me of the great cathedrals in Europe, you know. Awesome. And I'm standing in there waiting my turn in line. Even the teller's booths were marble. And I'm standing there and I prayed, God, Somehow, some way, we need a building. We don't have a farthing. That's Bible for nothing. <laughs> we have nothing. What are we going to do? And, and, and I'm not into spooky stuff. You guys know that. But there was a voice in my heart that said, I know you need a building, Dan, and you're standing in it. This is the building I'm going to provide. We found out it was on the tax duplicate for, I think it was six and a half million dollars. And we didn't have a dime. This has been 50 years ago. And we ended up with that structure, that gorgeous structure. We paid $80,000 for it. Now that's one occasion I can say absolutely without question, God spoke to me. That doesn't mean that God speaks to me every time I turn around because he doesn't. But the gifts of God, as outlined by Paul in 1 Corinthians, are very real, Joe. Yes. They're very real. And they're for the benefit of the whole body of Christ, not just a preacher. Absolutely. Or a deacon or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan. Emily Chrisman, that's Craig's little 11-year-old daughter, Craig that plays the saxophone, she asked... Uh, she had her mom send this question through Facebook. It says, the Bible says that we are all born into sin. What about babies that are still in the mother's womb? Is that baby considered a sinner? Tell her to ask her dad. <laughs> <laughs> what did he think, Dave? Chris, that's your question for tonight. <laughs> Well, once you're born, I think it's a whole different thing. But life does begin in the womb. Mm -hmm. We believe that. But, of course, that child would be born in innocence. Yes. And God would not hold that person responsible. You have to be able to come let us reason together yeah. and understand the gospel in order to be. Joe, you're yeah. better at this than I am. Yeah, I think what you're saying is right. We all have the stain of Adam and Eve on us, but God holding you responsible for those things. You know, this question could be expanded out what all skeptics or even Christians of goodwill ask. What happens to people that have never heard the word? What happens to people that are maybe mentally challenged? What happened to Jews prior to Christ? We would say that though they still had sin that needed redemption and covering, God mercifully applies those sort of things in situations where he would know better than we would. You know, Abraham said in Genesis, won't the, the governor of the universe do what's right? And so even in these situations where we're not sure the gospel didn't get to him or a missionary, sometimes supernatural things happen. There's an explosion in the Muslim world with regard to dreams with Jesus approaching Muslims. The, the gospel, 
the getting through. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I would say, yeah, that there's still a, a need of redemption, but there's no actual sin that's been enacted by the child. So God mercifully applies that. And we get hints of this. Um, in Psalms, David talks about this when he talks about his son that, or his child that was with Bathsheba. That was what he said, you, I, you can't come to me, but I can come to you. So mm-hmm. David's assuming that that child's in a, in, a, in a paradise scenario with God. Um, you also have the, the children of Israel prior to the age of accountability. Everybody before 18, you know, was allowed into the promised land in Exodus. So, um, so I think there are hints in the Bible about age of accountability, just like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 And tell that precious child <laughs> to ask easier questions. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, man. Uh, there, there's several people that have asked questions really similar to this and then other people were chiming in wanting the answer to this. Uh, It says a lot of people are worried because you're hearing reports that about putting chips in hands and all sorts of things right now. Um, uh, Putting chips in the hands and in the skin for identification. Uh, So people are worried about that and they're asking though this person said doesn't the mark of the beast come after the rapture? I know what John wrote in his epistle, and I don't think Antichrist is here, but the spirit of Antichrist has been here for a long time. Yeah. And it's, I believe it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, we in most Pentecostal circles, I think, and Joe, you can take off on this if you want to, but I truly do believe that the uh, tribulation takes place uh, after the rapture. I think we go first. Uh, it's a time of terrible condemnation. And yet God says, I don't hold you under condemnation, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So we're not under that. And it's one of the curses on Satan and on the earth what God is going to do someday. But when the church is taken out instantly, raptured, and somebody will say, well, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. No, but the phrase caught up is. And if you look in the new uh, dictionaries, it will say to you that caught up is a term used by some religious people to refer to the rapture. No kidding. So, yes, we believe the rapture takes place at any time. There's nothing that I know of, Joe, and I'm certainly not an expert, but uh, there's nothing that I know of that has to happen before Jesus comes. Uh, what's yeah. your thought? You've taken a pretty solid line on this pre-trib. Uh, Christians of goodwill, obviously, you've said this from the pulpit uh, maybe a half dozen times. Christians of goodwill can disagree, mid-trib, post-trib. But to the question, I, given what you've taught about this in the past, it looks like you would say, well, I, we don't, we, we're always aware of that, that, that spirit of Antichrist, that, that man of lawlessness Paul talks about in Thessalonians, uh, that's already here. But as far as being forced to get goods and resources by some sort of mark of allegiance, you would say that's, if that's going to come, that's likely going to come after the rapture if we go with the, the pre-trib scenario you've set up for us for so many years here. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I would say that you wouldn't have that particularly to worry about. We always stay alert. We always want to make sure that our loyalties are with Christ and that people know this. Uh, but I think you're right. It's, if, if we are going out and that, the scriptures seem to indicate pre-tribulation, that before things get really bad we're out of here, then that, that looks like that'll be in that situation where the, maybe the, the chip and that identification, that strong identification with the mark of the beast will be later. I don't know how you could read uh, Revelation 4, 5, and 6 and not buy into the whole pre-trib scenario. Those chapters make no sense in the way that they're laid out unless there's a rapture. Mm-hmm. Some years ago, and Joe, I've told you this, I know, some years ago, I was invited out to the West Coast to yeah. speak on why the church will not go through the tribulation. <laughs> so I quoted chapters of scripture because that's what we have to Amen. go on. Amen. And at the close of the service, I was approached by a very, very angry woman. And I was going to say lady, but I'm not sure about <laughs> that. So, but she was feminine and uh, <laughs> She approached me waving an umbrella. She was mad as a hornet. 
And she said to me, that's just crazy what you preach tonight. And she said, God, and she waved this thing in my face. And she said, <laughs> God has told me that I am going through the tribulation. I said, well, ma'am, I, I believe that. <laughs> but I don't plan to be there with you. <laughs> Her poor husband. <laughs> <laughs> or I don't know what happened to him. Absolutely. Right. Great. So your turn, Jonathan. Absolutely. Okay. Jonathan, Jonathan, one of the things that uh, has come to my mind is we uh, Christians that are especially paying attention to social media, yes. we need to be very careful what we buy into as, um, as doctrine, as truth. Yes. Of course, everything needs to be weighed according to the Word of God. Absolutely. But I, there's a tendency, and I'll see this happening, especially on Facebook, when one of these articles, especially like the one with the chip, yeah. people will jump on there and just automatically start. It's almost like they bought it. Oh, this is it. This is it. This is it. Yeah. Well, we need to be careful. Yes. You know, and judge it by the scriptures. And number two, if you're really concerned about it, pray about it. Yes. Prayer does work. Absolutely. And just another issue here. Thank you, David. It reminded me uh, when you read scripture and any time that God imposed his supernatural anger vis-a-vis -vis the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, he got his people out of there first. Now, the tribulation, at least as I see it in Scripture, is not man's anger. It's not man's wrath, man's inhumanity to man. It's God's anger. Yeah. In fact, Scripture clearly delineates the tribulation as a time, this time of Jacob's trouble. It's God's anger. So is he going to leave his people here on earth to go through that when he's promised us there is no more condemnation? Makes no sense at all. And now I've got a lot of people who believe they're going through it. In fact, a lot of them think this is the tribulation right now. Yes. Yeah. But I don't, and I, I think we're going to go up before the wrath comes down. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, one comment, uh, I, this one struck out to be, uh, it says, your friend Johnny Helton is watching from your hometown of Sioux City, Iowa tonight. <laughs> he pastors Morningside Assembly of God Church up there. And it's a booming church, and I love this guy very much. <laughs> Somebody asked, will there be different degrees of rewards in heaven and different degrees of punishment in hell? David? The answer is yes, and you can give the, 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 <laughs> the complete answer on that. No, you brought it up. No, <laughs> you go ahead. Yes, absolutely, there are going to be degrees of reward and degrees of punishment. Does someone who's just kind of in and out of church makes it as many Sundays as possible and maybe thinks he's doing all right, do you really think you're going to have the same reward as Paul? Really? What planet are you from? I don't want to follow Paul at the judgment seat of Christ. Read 1 Corinthians 3. That's the most haunting chapter in the Bible to me. And there are degrees. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. That little word, if, is huge. And it's the same thing with degrees of punishment. How could Lazarus, uh, how could the rich man talk to of Lazarus up on the other side if, if there were different, different degrees? Do you really think somebody who has just been carnal and never accepted Christ and just kind of blown it off, but never really did to people what Hitler did to people? Do you really think their judgment's going to be the same? I don't know what logic you're calling on there or what scripture you're calling. The judgment at any degree will be horrific, and the rewards at any pinnacle will be fantastic. So let's press on to the prize of our high calling in Christ Jesus. Yeah. 
Is that okay up there in Sioux City? <laughs> I've been meaning to call you, by the way. I guess this is about as good a time or other. I hope your snow is leaving. I grew up in your town and lived in your neighborhood my first 15 years. And I love that town. I love you, Brother Johnny. Thanks for calling in. Somebody uh, asked, can you comment on the status of your proposed trip to Israel? I wanted to go, uh, especially if this is your last trip, but I've declined up to this point given the circumstances. Well, sure. You know, Netanyahu closed Israel down tightly, uh, tightly. I talked to some of my friends over there in Jerusalem. They live in Jerusalem. In fact, they live just a few miles from the Gaza Strip. And they said Israel proper is pretty well a virus, not free, but it's not as bad there because Netanyahu closed everything down. And we had some people, were you there then? <laughs> this guy was there in, in Israel with some of our college kids. And you were given how long to get out of town? Uh, seven hours. That, really? had, that had nothing to do with the virus. <laughs> 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 Get out of here. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Jonathan got out of there, too. So we, we had to get up at seven hours. Seven hours, we had to wake him up at one in the morning. College students, get him out, get him, and it was during Purim. So they're all, it was two in the morning and people were crowded the streets. Young people were How'd crowded. How'd you get a plane? We, well, that, that, it was the last one. It was the last boat off the island. It was the last <laughs> one for our, uh, for Virgin. So yeah. we, we got it and it was. Otherwise it, you'd have had to stay there. Uh, yeah, even now. On into, they said two weeks minimal, but maximal it could have been months. So. Well, that's really what caused us to cancel the that, trip. We were supposed to leave this next week. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that's the only reason, but we have rescheduled <laughs> it. And uh, those of you who've paid good money into it, that's still solid. You're okay. Yeah. And you're confirmed. And uh, we're going to go, I believe, Ginny, our tour coordinator, told me yeah. February, uh, maybe. February the 17th uh, through March the 2nd. February Thank 17th. you. That's great. I Googled. No. <laughs> well, it's going to be a great trip. This will be my last one, as we've told you many times. Uh, you're laughing. <laughs> I've heard it for years. I love it. That's great. You, you know what? I have been so homesick for Israel oh, today. Man. Yeah. Oh, man. There's something about it. And, and I happened to catch some pictures on my computer mm. of the last time we were there. I just love to be there. Yeah. I always feel tranquility, mm. peace. And uh, so, God willing, we're going to go next uh, February. I'd like to be there now because there's nobody there. And it's usually packed. Every so, yeah. street is packed. Every cathedral is oh, yeah. packed. Oh, yeah. But right now would be great, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. How many times have you been there, Joe? Just twice. But Pastor, if you, want to, you don't want to miss this one with Pastor Betzer. I'm not, I'm not one for doing advertisements, but... We had a guy come over that had been to Israel a dozen times and had lunch, Rice Brooks, some years ago, a couple years back, yeah. and pastor started talking to him at lunch. And this guy was blown away at the encyclopedic knowledge of just tr even trivial things in Israel. It was unbelievable. He was just in awe. So you don't want to miss a trip. If, if Pastor Dan's going, get on it. Get on the trip. Well, it's my home, away from home, you know. Yeah. And it's where Jesus walked. Unbelievable. And there's just something. That, it's not the trip of a lifetime. It's more than that. Yeah. It will change your life. It will change the way you read the Bible. Mm. And uh, I'll give you just a little sidebar. About 10 years ago, and I've been there every year for decades. Right. I went over to spend some time with a shepherd in Bethlehem. You talk about fun. You know what we had for dinner? He would shoot pigeons, <laughs> and we would eat those critters. That's Were right. they good? Huh? Were they good? Yeah, man. It's like eating chicken or quail. Good food there, old oh, man. Huh? Uh, pigeons? 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay. So one day we're way out in the Tulis. He had about 100 sheep, and most of them he was just responsible for. They weren't his. But he was responsible for their well-being. And we came across a huge rock, 
It was about this high up off the ground, and it was very porous. And somebody had taken a sharp implement and carved it out, and it looked like a huge birdbath. And I said, what is this? He said, this is a sheep cup. He said, we shepherds find these, and we carve these out, and we fill these water skins with water and pour in there, and they'll hold gallons of water. So when David wrote, the Lord is my shepherd, my cup runneth over. He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about more water than you'll ever need. So it's little things like that that you pick up every time you turn around over there. Makes the Bible a different book. Unbelievable. Let's go today, Joe. Absolutely. Let's go. Well, <laughs> we'll see. It would be awesome. Um, so, and speaking of Israel, somebody said, I know you've been to Israel many times and you've interacted with a lot of uh, Jewish folks. Have you met many Jewish folks who believe Jesus is the Messiah? Oh, heavens, yes. There's some big churches in Jerusalem. And uh, I have a friend who's pastored there for many years. I suppose there's 1,500 to 2,000 people a week mm. wow. go to church. It's the biggest building downtown Jerusalem. Mm. And uh, it's a full gospel Pentecostal church. It's gorgeous. They gutted the first three floors and built one of the most beautiful sanctuaries I've ever seen. And it's packed every Friday night. They go to church on Friday night. And uh, there's some huge churches, and churches are cropping up all over that country. It's amazing, really. And I have, I've been going there since 1971. I have never experienced any kind of opposition to declaring the gospel if it's done sanely and biblically. And uh, here in town, some of the rabbis are among my closest friends. Yeah. We have breakfast together. When I had the stroke and I was in the hospital, two of them came up and prayed for me. <laughs> they prayed for me in Yiddish. So I said, you guys better tell me what you're praying for because I don't understand what <laughs> words you're saying. Am I going to get better or am I going to die? One of the two. But I love that fellowship with my Jewish friends. And, uh, oh, yes, I've met many people there who've committed their lives to Christ. And here. And here. Yeah. Somebody said, Pastor, I believe that you said once that children continue to mature after they go to heaven. That may not be correct, but they said, if I misunderstood, please correct me. But I have two husbands in heaven and I have two babies there. Um, can you tell me if that conclusion is correct? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I think so because... Joe, you're better at this than I am. We shall know as we are known. And if you know me as I am known, I continue to mature and get older and bigger. <laughs> so I, sus I suspect that I don't think if I died as a six-month-old child, I would want to spend eternity as a s being wheeled around heaven in a what do you call them? Bassinet. Bassinet. Like exactly, or a stroller. <laughs> so I believe that we mature, Sure. but that's what I think. Yeah. This is one of those areas, I think, where you've talked about how frustrating the Bible is with not giving us a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I don't know what age we'll be. You know, I'd imagine there's probably progression. We know we can recognize people, so we know we're not just, you know, just go, you know, ghost we images. Shall know as we, we are known. known. So, and, and you can recognize love relationships. You can recognize difference and distinction. But how... What age? How will I, will I recognize difference without being jealous or envious? I don't know how that's going to work, but I can't imagine not being bored forever. So, but that's heaven. So, I, so it's the Bible, frustratingly, but I get logically, underrepresents heaven so we don't all just jump there and try to get there beforehand. So. And the Bible says that we are becomers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That means progression does, of maturity. Does. We are, doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. him. Yeah. So, oh, I think, yes. I, it's just my opinion, really, but development, I suppose. development, though. I think you're exactly right. The development, development, yes. Yeah, for sure. And mentally, we'll develop. Oh, that's, yeah, Paul even said that. Would that be so. good? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> then we could answer all these questions. No there you go. <laughs> Somebody asked, uh, what's, one, what's been one thing that you have seen God or think that he's doing uh, during this time of crisis uh, in the U.S. Mm. and around the world? Mm. 
Dave, you want to answer that? I think it's caused us, a lot of us, to just get back to basics. What is the gospel all about? Um, as much as we love First Assembly, as much as we love the buildings that we meet in week to week and things like that, you know, we are, we're learning that the church is people. That's right. Yeah. And uh, this whole online experience that all of us have had in the past few weeks has really taught us some lessons, I think. How do we better um, even communicate, even future after this is over with, how do we better communicate uh, with, uh, with people? How do we better communicate the gospel? So I think there's, uh, there are a lot of pluses that we have learned through and still learning. And in fact, I've, I've been talking to some of the pastors about this and we're gonna talk more about it uh, this next week, you know, what, what has this, what is this saying to us? It's very important that we hear it. And it's very important that we, uh, whatever we need to change, let's change it. Let's go on with the gospel. Yeah. This may not get me a lot of accolade or applause, but uh, I think God doesn't want us to love this world too much. I, I think that's a clear theme in the Bible. I think you see it all the time that he, he wants us to understand that we are, no matter how controlled our environment is, we're dependent upon him. Uh, th this, is, this is one of those times where you're forced into a situation of dependence where you, you, have, you have a naked trust in God. You're, you don't have the supports of a church and a, a direct like three-dimensional community. You have to go virtually. How are you going to seek and find in this time? But God doesn't want us to put all of our eggs in this basket. We just had a question about heaven. It, this, is a, this is something where God wants us to trust him and understand that, that there's a bigger universe and a bigger world that he has prepared for us for those that love him. Uh, and, and just coming to terms with that in any, in any hard time, in any, any struggle, is to understand our dependency, which is a major biblical theme, and then just not to, you know, we're not to fall in love with this world and be so attached to this world that we're devastated when even a little, little tremor happens. So it does build a, a, a spiritual resilience. I think that's really, really important. But I love your, the point about us taking what are really bonuses in our Christian walk, church, and the music, and the wonderful presentation, and acting like they're necessities. You know, that's, some, that's a lesson we all have had to learn, that this, you know, there's something more fundamental about your commitment to Christ. And yeah. I think we're going to value what is really important more than we ever have before. Yes. Yes. We're going to value, like I said, you know, people and each other. Right. We yeah. are going to value the corporate body meeting together yes. more than we ever have before. Yeah. I, I saw comments on Facebook today about people ju that just anticipating being able to hug people again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's so important. That is. And uh, once we're able to do that again, I, th I think we will forever be changed in the, in the concept of church and who we are and who, uh, what is the, the church made of? It's made up of people. Yeah, in Hebrews it says don't forsake the gathering of together with one another. I think we're seeing all that, we're, but you, don't, you don't miss something until it's gone, right? So contrast tends to clarify. So you see that there's something that's, that you can't get. You just can't get electronically. Electronically is great, it's beautiful. The Lord's had us in this time period that we can do this. But there's certain things, service, fellowship with one another, right. corporate worship, hearing the word proclaimed with you there. It, there's something big about that. There's something biblical about that. So, yeah. What do you think? I think it's a good reminder, too, not to assume that our friends are okay right now. You know, I checked right. on somebody the other day, and they were really, really struggling. Yeah. There's a single person. Yes. They're cooped up at home all alone and really mentally, emotionally having a hard time. Yes. And so I think it, as, as Christians, it's just to... Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. There are people weeping right now because of what's going on, and I think we need to be sensitive to that and, sure. and uh, be cognizant of that with the people in our spheres of, uh, of influence. And, and be the, this is a great chance to be the body of Christ yes. extended, you know. Yes. And pastors are not exempt. No. I have lost five good friends this week. Wow. And, uh, and precious, precious people. So it, it cuts across all lines, you know, yes. and we share together. Uh, what's the old song? Uh, 
When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear and rejoice in his victory in this something so dear. I can't remember words to songs. And uh, so for those of you who have suffered losses this week, you're not alone. And uh, it's cut across all distinctions. And, uh, but we're going to get through it. Amen. We'll overcome. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Somebody asked uh, what your favorite Bible verse is and what your favorite Bible story is. You're asking me? They're asking you. <laughs> well, one of my favorite Bible stories, honestly, and not just coincidentally, is the one I speak about tomorrow. The story of Hosea, I think it's one of the most incredible love stories ever told. Oh, what a film that would make. Can't you just see Hosea walking in that darkened warehouse, looking in vain for his wife, Gomer, who has sold him out, no longer the beauty she once was, now just an old hag, broken, toothless, and he looks, and there he sees this wretched woman tied up. And he turns to walk away, has no idea who she is. And he hears a voice say, Hosea. Oh, man, I got goosebumps just telling you that. What a story that, that's my favorite story. <laughs> Tomorrow it'll be different. <laughs> Somebody said, I always wonder where humanity is going to be when the earth is burned up and replaced with the new earth. Humanity. Where humanity, where, the human kind. where hum, humankind will People. be. Yeah. Oh, we're going to be with the Lord. Yeah. So we shall we ever be with him? Isn't that something? This whole world's going to be destroyed and a new one. Remade. A brand new one. And it'll be perfect. This is a good one. I love this planet. Absolutely. <laughs> it's going to be a new one. And this, uh, this, is, this one's over my head, but it said over 20 years ago, I had a dream of seven trumpets and angels sounding them. Uh, they're talking about the phases, the seals phase and the trumpet phase. Do you think we're in the seals phase or the trumpet phase? No. <laughs> there no, you go. <laughs> we're not neither one. The first seal is going to be opened up by Jesus in chapter right. 6 of Revelation. We've already been two chapters around the throne. So I don't know how you're going to explain that one if you deny the rapture of the church. But we'll be with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with him when that happens. That's chapter 6, and it's just as clear as a bell if you'll read it. You know David Koresh with the Branch Davidians? Yeah. He made his living telling people that he was the only one who could explain the seven seals. Wow. Well, my goodness, any child who goes to Sunday school where they teach the Bible could tell you what the seals were. And you don't want to be here. When, when Jesus starts to tear off those seals, you don't want to be here unless you're with the Lord. <laughs> Uh, this is one, and I think this was asked last time, and we didn't get to it, and we talked about it. So the, the, um, the, the, this one, it says, in the book of Exodus, it says that the midwives told Pharaoh mm. that they couldn't get there in time to kill the Israelite baby boys during birth. This was obviously a lie. However, it says that God blessed them for it. Does this mean that God blesses lying in certain situations? How do you know that was a lie? Maybe they couldn't get an Uber. <laughs> Maybe they called and called and nobody came. How do you know they were lying, couldn't get there? You know, they didn't have taxis and buses and subways right. back in those days. So I, I think it's a presumption to say, well, they were just lying. We don't know that. That's a cop out, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Uber cop out was the best. No, I think if you look at even the Ten Commandments, which are supposed to be transcultural, anytime you have more than one moral rule, there's a possibility of conflict. Anybody can logically see that. So I, even if you were a, a child, say a Hebrew child, and uh, you had this do not, you know, don't, be, don't bear false witness, one of the Ten Commandments. Also honor your father and mother. 
Well, it's more than conceivable. We know it happened that their parents sometimes would make them worship idols. If that child refused, they, they can't keep both commandments. So the question has become God is in a situation ethicist, a la Fletcher or something like that. It's just the idea that when two commands, and that happens anytime you have more than one moral command, anytime two commands come into conflict, God tells us which one. Which one doesn't overrides for that particular situation. So whether it's Corey Tim Boone or it's the if it was the midwives that did lie, there are a number of things you can say that God doesn't. You don't owe truth for that if li- if life is on the line. Um, it doesn't mean that you decide based on the situation. It doesn't mean that God's a relativist. It means that whenever inevitable conflict comes with more than one moral rule, God tells us this is technically called graded absolutism. It's absolutism, but it's graded not graded by you, graded by God. So apparently, whenever conflict comes about, God says the higher ethic is to preserve of life. That's the idea. So <laughs> does that, that's one of the ways I think I look at, you could say that they didn't owe them the truth. If they were, if, the, if a life was threatened, you could say, we have this intuition that words are ordained for truth to match reality. But when God puts those uh, parameters in order and there's, an, there's a conflict that happens, he decides, he decides which one's acceptable and which one isn't. That's the same that would cover the Rahab scenario as yes. well. So your thoughts? You've been reading Linux again. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Exactly, I've been reading Russian. So yes, you're right. Yes. <laughs> and you've been telling me for years you're going to get him here, uh, but he's he's very. He only comes once a year. That's to Dr. State. Lennox that's, from. Yes, is he yeah, in London? He's Oxford. Yes. So. And brilliant. Oh, his books. Oh, you can't go wrong with him, right, Pastor? You introduced me to him. Thank yes, you. Yes, you're welcome. Excellent man. Excellent Thank man. You. But yeah. Uh, someone says, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) 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 Why would you not want to go to church when, first of all, Jesus said, if you love me, do what I tell you to do. Yeah. So we, we benefit from coming to church. What do you mean do I have to go to church? I can't wait to get into the house of God. Yeah. When I'm on vacation, I go to church somewhere. Yeah. Darlene and I find a good church home. I need, it. I need to be there. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some who ask questions like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> why, why, would you, why would you neglect being in God's house if you love him? David, you might as well get in trouble too here. So, yeah. so join no, us. The, the join scripture us. that came to my mind immediately was the one you just quoted. The uh, forsake not the assembling of your, yourselves together as the matter of some is. Uh, you know, I grew up in the church. Yes, you did. I have never known anything else but the church. And uh, yeah, I visited a lot of different denominations and and checked out a lot of things, and I'm exactly where I need to be. I need the church. I need the church. I like the assembling of of together, but I need the church being the people in the church. I need them because they feed into my spirit. They feed truth into my spirit. I need to hear the word. I need to hear the word as it is presented under the anointing. And we need that, especially in today's difficult times. Uh, we need it more than ever. I really believe that. And you know, I need the music. Yeah. I, I love what Jonathan does here. And the music, the choir, a lot of churches don't have choirs anymore. That's a preference thing, I guess. But I love the choir. Mm-hmm. Some of those songs you sing, Jonathan, just thrill me Praise the Lord. and uh, to hear the church sing oh I need that it builds me up in the innermost being the Bible says so why would you not want to be in God's that's right. house that's like saying do you want to go to the best restaurant in town for a steak no I just would rather <laughs> starve no I want to I want to go to Wendy's if they're open you know, I don't care. I just, I just need the food. I need the food that comes to this congregation through Sunday school, through you guys. All of you are involved in different things here. There are so many ways to get the gospel out. What would, what would the world be without the church? You think about that. Yeah. 
I don't think you'd want to be here too long. And, you know, speaking of ways to reach out, we're going off the air right now, but I want to take a second and say uh, on, we're going to keep going on Facebook, but we, on, we're on live right now on Kingdom FM, and I just want to say thank you to them for broadcasting Amen. this yes. every night. It's a every, great station. Every Saturday night at 6 o'clock, uh, Art, the radio manager there, is a dear friend of the church. Yes, he is. does so much for us. So thank you guys on Kingdom FM for, for uh, everything you do for us. Uh, you know, another question, somebody said, what's your favorite thing about ministry. Joe, you want to start? Yeah, I, I'm a, I, I'm a conversion junkie. I love reading good conversions where somebody's done a 180 on something, where somebody's really had a significant life change. You mentioned this, I think last time we did the Q&A. Um, I, I collect stories, conversion stories, <laughs> um, uh, especially whether they're one way or the other, but most coming from non-belief to belief. So seeing someone actually really get it and really run with it, uh, that, that understands the gospel, that moves from, even, even moving from a transactional kind of, you know, I'm going to work my way to heaven to the actual gospel where they depend on Jesus, come to church, pray and confess, put their whole being into it. It's, there's really nothing like it I, when, when it really takes, nothing like it. Um, so I, I, I think that's my favorite part, easily my favorite part uh, of being a minister during this time is just seeing that, that sort of thing happen. Proclamation and then seeing it actually take with somebody is amazing. It's amazing. David? I think seeing people come to faith and then grow in faith, yeah. those are the things that, that just really feed me and, and being able to even implement that on an administrative level is really uh, rewarding. I love the preaching. You, you might expect that. I just love to hear a great preacher. I don't want to hear somebody tell me how to improve my dating life, which is what you hear on a lot of Christian programs today. Hey, I'm past that. You know, uh, talk to me about my burial life. That now you're getting to where I live. What's it going to be like when I see Jesus? There is a handful of pastors on television that I just love. And I try not to miss their programs. Because what they feed me is terrific. Most of the time I've never even thought of it. And, and they're deep. And I want to hear about the deep things of life. I don't want to hear patty cake, patty cake you know, all that. And I don't want to hear songs like that either. I want to hear the great, profound truths of the Bible. And uh, I've had friends who've come to our house, great, great scholars of the Word. And we're still talking when the sun comes up in the morning because it is so rich. It's the Word that feeds me. I love it. I love it. And uh, if you ever want to know what some of those preachers are, call me, I'll tell you. But I just love to hear them preach. Some I, I don't have time for, but, but the great expositors, that's the word, isn't it? Expositors of the word, they tell me what the Bible says, are just terrific. We've all been by you studying the great pulpiteers. You, oh, I mean, it's a absolutely. study for you. Well, maybe even a hobby. Can we call it a hobby for you? It's a hobby to study them, to listen to them. One of my favorites was J. Vernon McGee, oh, who's been with the Lord now for a long time. And uh, I got to meet him years and years ago, just before he died. And his book, Through the Bible, it's a high volume set. I just love it. It's on every verse in the Bible. And uh, he used to be on the radio every day, still is in some places. <laughs> Jay Vernon speaks to us from the grave, they say, you know. <laughs> but I love him. He had that scratchy old voice, you know. But I, oh man, I love to hear him <laughs> preach. David Jeremiah, oh, what depth, what profound depth. He just went through a study on Daniel. Mm. Oh my goodness, breathtaking. And so many others, you know, that are, are just fantastic. And they're not crazy. They're not knocking people over. They're not predicting they can say abracadabra and the virus goes away. <laughs> these, are, these are people who are real, who have depth to them. Man, they feed my soul. Amen. I love them. 
And that's what I love about the church is being fed the word. Yeah. Well, we, I know I speak on behalf of everybody. We love your preaching and we're thankful. And I know, you know, I've watched the comments tonight. We're so thankful for you, Pastor, Amen. and I mean that sincerely. Amen. And I'm thankful. I know you're talking about retiring and, and all of that, but I'm thankful. No, that I'm not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> well, we are thankful that for this time that you have been here as a source of stability. Yeah. And uh, just you have, you have yeah. been such a blessing through this whole time. In all seriousness, um, this thing of retirement has been a huge issue to me. Because I love to preach, right. and I love to prepare the Word. I really do. Even now with this stroke, when it's very hard for me to read and prepare, I still love to do it. That's why I'm so anxious for tomorrow to talk to you about Hosea. <laughs> oh, what a story. It is so blessed to get into that. And I'm just going to miss it. And I... I'm still going to listen to those people and read those people who feed my soul. I wouldn't go to a restaurant where they didn't feed me. Right. Last Wednesday night, I asked this question. Would you buy half a car? <laughs> would you, I mean, would you go, let's take the Chevy dealer. Would you go to the Chevy dealer, wherever that person may be, and say, I want to buy a car. Well, all we have are just transmissions. Well, that's what a lot of churches do. Well, we don't believe this part. I had a pastor tell me, I've never preached a sermon on prophecy in my life. I don't want to scare people. It's right. exactly what he told me. Well, what are you going to do with one-third of this book that was prophetic at the time of his writing? I said, it must be easy for you to carry your Bible around. It's just a pamphlet. and That's all you've got left, you know, to preach the whole. Con that's what Paul said. I declared the whole counsel of God. It was Paul, wasn't it? Yes. I declared the whole counsel of God. So yeah. you just got me going again. <laughs> Somebody asked a great question. Uh, this one hasn't been asked since we've been doing this. Uh, can you tell me the difference between grace and mercy? Well, Joe will be better at this than I am. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think. I think that, that grace has to do with after you've met the Lord and it's his grace that yeah. sustains yeah. you and yeah. keeps you pure. And mercy is what keeps you out of hell. Yeah. Now that's probably a very, the theologian here can help me. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, I think most would say that grace is a more fulsome mercy that has more supernatural quality to it. You know, Paul says we don't grieve as the rest of the world. So there's, a, there's something about just a general mercy that's not getting what you deserve. Grace adds to that and saying, well, not only do you not get what you deserve, but you're going to give even more than you even imagined. So it's, 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 it's just an extension of mercy into a, into a bigger, more, more robust. That, that's how most theologians Have you noticed it. all the commercials on TV right now that call in this number and oh, get, gosh. get the insurance you deserve? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I yeah. would be glad to raise money to help them out so they <laughs> the insurance you deserve. Yeah. Get what you deserve. Yes. Well, I don't want what I deserve. I want what I I want the mercy. But back yeah. to what you were talking about, that's a tough topic to preach on in an entitlement age. You preach on unmerited mercy and unmerited grace in an age that says, I deserve all these things. This is what I deserve. I, I'm yeah. gonna affirm my rights. That's tough preaching, but that's biblical preaching, isn't it? Yeah, you just opened up another hour. <laughs> Do it in Jay Burnham McGee's voice. <laughs> Do the whole hour. <laughs> no, well, I love the man. <laughs> My favorite Jay Vernon McGee. I, I was driving down the road one day. And this was a recorded one he did, and he said, "I've never liked Solomon. Solomon was a sissy. <laughs> I about hit a truck, man, because <laughs> I kind of feel the same way." Oh my gosh. Well, ladies, 
Jonathan, get us out of here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, one more question, and then, uh, but before I turn it back to Pastor, let me just remind you to join us at 11 o'clock in the morning. We're going to be here live. I'll have the worship team here, the band. We're going to have live music, and then Pastor's going to preach on Hosea. And uh, I, I always look forward to your preaching, but after tonight, I'm really looking forward to that message in the morning. But please join us in the morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, one more question is, uh, do you think that all the increased floods and wildfires, tornadoes, storms that we're seeing are signs of the end times? Not necessarily. Yeah. Could yeah. be. Hmm. Perilous times will come, but it ain't nothing like it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. These are just little inconveniences, and, and I don't see a great revelation behind every little change in the weather, every storm that comes right. by. So, no, I, I'd look for other things. I'd look, if you want a signpost, study Israel. Yeah. yeah. That's a real signpost of what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Pastor, thank you for doing this tonight. This has been another great night. Are I, we uh, still there, employed here? Now? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for watching. That's so great of you to absolutely. do Absolutely. And Joe, Joe has his doctorate in apologetics. That's a great subject, the defense of the faith. That's right. Helps with evangelism. Huh? It helps with evangelism for oh, sure. Oh yeah, and to be able to know what you believe, why you believe it, that's one of the marks of a mature believer. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Well, thank you for joining us, and we have enjoyed being with you tonight, and again, I hope you'll join us in the morning at 11 o'clock, and we wish you the best. We're praying for you, Amen. we miss you, and we love you. God bless God you. Bless Good night. You. God bless you. Excellent.